going on? What's all the racket? Enough to wake the dead. This episode contains adult themes. Listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to another episode of Prasher's Murder Map. Today I invite you to join me on a journey back to early 19th century London, to a den of violence, danger and prostitution, the notorious Ratcliffe Highway. Back then, Ratcliffe Highway had a reputation and not a good one. It was located north of the Ratcliffe waterfront and was known as one of the most crime-ridden streets in the whole of London. It housed brothels, lodging houses, opium dens, grocers, bakers and other shops, and plenty of public houses, an old-fashioned term for pubs or inns. Many people were too scared to venture into this dark recess of criminality, and it was only about a mile away from the other insalubrious districts of Spitalfields and Whitechapel in London's East End, which would become the scene of the Jack the Ripper murders in the 1880s. In the latter part of the century, It would also be home to a wild animal dealer and the scene of an unfortunate incident involving an escaped Bengal tiger and a young boy. The story goes that the owner, Charles Jamrak, gave chase and prized open the tiger's jaw with his bare hands, releasing the very scared but unharmed child. Nowadays, the highway bears few signs of his infamous past and is a heavily congested route in and out of central London but its colourful history has not been forgotten and has been associated with several famous names over the years. Oscar Wilde and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle are both said to have visited the local opium dens, the latter apparently only for research when writing his Sherlock Holmes stories. Captain Cook, the first British explorer to land in Australia, also lived in the area for a time. On the cold winter evening of December 7th, 1811, Tim Ma and his family were still working hard in their draper's shop, which sold textiles and fabrics, at 29 Ratcliffe Highway. It was very late, 11 o'clock or even close to midnight, but 19th century London was almost a city that never sleeps, and it was normal for people to keep very late hours. As they were thinking about closing up for the night, Ma asked his servant girl, Margaret Jewell, to go to the local baker's to pay the weekly bill and to purchase some oysters from a street stall. Although seen as a luxury now, in those days oysters were actually considered a poor man's food and were readily available. Margaret did as she was asked, but Mr Taylor's oyster shop was closed. She went onto the baker's and to get there she had to walk past the draper's shop again. As she did so, she noticed Tim Ma, his wife Celia and the shop boy James Gowan, all going about their work inside in a warm glow of lamplight. She shivered, drawing her scarf more closely around her shoulders and quickly hurried on, hoping to soon get back into the warm. She paid the bill at the baker's and hurried back to Mr Marr's shop, no doubt keen to finish up for the night and go home. What she saw when she returned was very strange. Although only 20 minutes had passed, the shop was in total darkness and the door was locked. It was almost as though all the light and sound had been sucked out of the shop. Margaret knocked, but there was no answer. She put her ear to the door and thought she had heard footsteps on the stairs and the masked three-month-old baby crying. She then heard footsteps on a nearby pavement which slowly faded away. She wondered what had happened. Had the baby woken because it heard her knocking or had something else disturbed the child? She became increasingly worried and pounded harder with the wooden knocker. She wondered if the Mars had gone to bed and forgotten about her Here, what's going on? What's all the racket? Enough to wake the dead! She recognised the voice. It was George Olney, the night watchman, whose job was to announce the time every half an hour and to check that nothing out of the ordinary was happening. He was also a friend of Mr Ma. Relieved to see a familiar face, Margaret explained the situation. George tried calling and knocking as well, 
but he only succeeded in waking the Mars neighbour. John Murray the pawnbroker came running out of his house next door to see what all the noise was about. They all stood and looked up at the house. The shutters were closed but not fastened, which was unusual. Murray said he would try the back of the shop, so he vaulted over the fence in his back garden and into the adjoining yard belonging to the Mars. He saw a light on at the rear of the shop and noticed the back door was open. He entered the shop and called out but nothing stirred. By now, even the baby had stopped crying. It was completely silent. What Murray saw next, he would remember for the rest of his life. Near the stairs lay the blood-drenched form of James Gowan, the shop boy. His face and head had been pulverised and brain matter splattered the walls and floor. Murray gulped and opened the front door to let the night watchman in. But as he did so, he tripped over something. Squinting in the dim light, he realised it was the body of Celia Marr. Her head had been severely bashed in and blood was still flowing. George Olney came in, probably warning Margaret that she should stay away from the grotesque scene. It didn't take long for them to find Tim Marr. His body was on the floor behind the counter. He had also been battered to death with immense ferocity. Struggling to take in the horrors before them, Murray suddenly whispered, What about the baby? They've got a little baby. The two men hurried upstairs, where they found a truly tragic sight before them. Tim Marr Jr., just three months old, lay dead in his blood-soaked cot. He had been hit over the head, and one side of his face was crushed, and his throat slit with his head almost decapitated. It's appalling even to write about and speak of, so I can't imagine how Murray and Olney must have felt. It is perhaps a small mercy that young Tim's parents didn't live to see their son killed. By this time, a crowd of people had started to congregate outside, wondering what all the noise was about, and the River Thames police officers were called. It would be another 18 years before the first professional police force would be set up by Sir Robert Peel, for now, parish constables, magistrates and coroners examined local crimes and in many cases were not even paid for their trouble. The river police, who existed to protect ships and cargo, assisted the magistrate and coroner with investigations but were not equipped or trained to deal with major crimes. The first authorities on the scene found the murder weapon, a blood-stained shipbuilder's hammer which still had human hair attached to it. It was found in the upstairs bedroom implying that the child had been killed last, which is supported by the fact that Margaret heard the child's very last cries on this earth while she was knocking on the door. The killer must have fled just moments later. There was no theft which was puzzling, but some suggested that the killer had simply been interrupted by Margaret's return before he had a chance to burgle and quickly fled out the back. There was no apparent motive. Two sets of footprints were found at the back of the shop with flecks of sawdust in them, and police surmised the murders were the work of two people. Various suspicious characters were arrested, and a reward of £50 was offered, a lot of money in those days, but all of this led to nothing. The body of Mr and Mrs Marr and their shop boy James Gowan were laid out for people to view, as was the macabre custom of the time. This brought in grieving relatives and crowds of gawping slum tourists, the public liked blood, gore and scandals. Perhaps it was just a more sinister version of today's reality television or YouTube. The police, such as they were, were criticised, and as news spread throughout London, everybody felt unsafe. Well, even less safe than they had before. When the hammer was examined and the dried blood was washed away, officers saw the initials JP or possibly IP. They couldn't tell which. Of course, forensics and fingerprints didn't exist at this time, so they saw nothing wrong with washing away the evidence, and it would be another 80 years before fingerprints would be used to solve a crime for the first time, and that was in Argentina, not England. When the coroner's inquest was held on December 10th, it was thought that somebody must have been watching the draper's shop because of the timing of the murder. The servant had only gone out for 20 minutes, so it was either a lucky coincidence for Margaret or a deliberate decision by the killer to wait until there were fewer people to overpower. The murder was estimated to have been between 11.55 and 12.15. Just 12 days after the Draper shop for murders, 
the killer struck again, just half a mile away in New Gravel Lane. Mr and Mrs Williamson ran the King's Arm Tavern. Living with them were their 14-year-old granddaughter Kitty, the house servant Bridget Harrington and a lodger called John Turner. On December 19th, Mr Williamson had made a complaint to a constable that a strange man had been seen hanging around the area and listening at doors. The constable reassured him that he would keep a lookout as he continued on his rounds. Not long after, he heard a scream of, Murder! Murder! The constable raced back to the King's Arms to see a large crowd of people outside the tavern. They were watching a man in his night clothes descending from the second floor using what looked like a blanket tied in knots. When he shakily reached firm ground, he managed to tell the crowd that he was John Turner, the lodger, and he just witnessed a violent murder. The crowd broke down the front door and found three bodies inside. Mr Williamson had been hit over the head with an iron bar which lay next to him, his throat cut and blood trickling freely over the steps. Mrs Williamson and the servant Bridget were found with their skulls smashed and their throats cut. The knife wounds were so deep that they had gone through to the bone. Amazingly, 14-year-old Kitty was found upstairs alive and unharmed, apparently having slept through the violent frenzy. Witnesses came forward to say they had seen a tall strange man loitering around the pub during the day, but police were also suspicious of the lodger John Turner as his odd method of escaping the house could be seen as trying to flee the scene while diverting suspicion elsewhere. A reward of a hundred guineas was posted. There seems to be no connection between the two families and Mr Williamson's watch had been stolen. Was it a burglary gone wrong? Did somebody really commit all these violent murders just to steal a trinket? At the inquest, John Turner said he had gone to bed at 10.40pm but shortly afterwards, he had heard the tavern door open with a bang. Bridget cried out, We're all murdered! And Mr Williamson shouted, I'm a dead man! It's unclear whether this just reflects the unusual turn of phrase they had back in the 1800s, or whether John Turner was imagining a more dramatic version of events. He explained that next he heard several blows. He crept downstairs, keeping to the shadows, and caught a glimpse of a man about six feet tall, leaning over Mrs Williamson. Seeing that there was nothing to be done, he tiptoed back upstairs, made his escape rope and lowered himself out of the window, desperate to save his own skin. So who committed these seven atrocious murders less than two weeks apart and why? The police received some tips, but the evidence was circumstantial. In those days, without any kind of forensics, evidence nearly always was. John Williams was an Irish sailor and a former mutineer, although some accounts said he was Scottish. He was described as slenderly built, thin, wiry, and clear of all superficial flesh. To me, he sounds almost vampiric. He had been ashore at the time and apparently returned home late on the night of the murders with blood on his shirt, although he claimed it was from a fight. He was arrested anyway and taken to Cold Barfield's prison. On Christmas Eve, the room that he shared with two other sailors at the Pear Tree Lodging House was searched. His landlady said he always paid his rent and was honest, but there were a few things that stood against him. Police discovered he had been an acquaintance of Ma. He had also been seen frequently at Williamson's Tavern, including on the night of the murder. Someone said he was flush with money afterwards, but didn't have any beforehand, although he claimed the money had come from pawning clothes and he had a ticket to prove it. But there were some other characters involved in the story. Cornelius Hart was a carpenter who'd done some work at the Mar shop on the day of the murder. The carpentry work would explain the flecks of sawdust found at the scene. He claimed to have lost a chisel at the shop sometime that day and had apparently asked Ma about it several times. Ma had searched the shop but couldn't find it. However, the police had seen a chisel placed in a prominent position and removed it as evidence, so it's unclear why it couldn't previously be found, unless this was just all a story. Hart was interviewed, and witnesses proved there was a link between the two. He had reportedly sent a message to the Pear Tree Tavern very soon after the murders to ask whether Williams was being kept in custody. Why would he care? Perhaps he knew Williams quite well. 
Another person of interest was William Long Billy Ablas. He was a sailor who had once been on the same ship as the Gaunt Williams. He and Williams were both seen drinking at the King's Arms on the night of the murder, and he also fitted John Turner's description of a very tall man. Most interesting of all, it turned out that the murdered Mr. Ma had worked for the East India Company before going into business on his own as a draper, and he had worked with both Ablas and Williams. However, Williams was the only one officially arrested and imprisoned for the crime. Just a few days after his arrest, he was found hanging in his cell before there could be a proper hearing. His body was paraded through the streets, which strangely enough was common at that time, although before long the government thankfully put a stop to this practice. After the bloodthirsty crowds had got a good look, they put William's body in a hole in the ground at a crossroads with a stake driven through his heart. It seems unbelievable that such medieval justice was still being carried out in the 1800s. It also oddly confirms the view of him being cadaverous and vampiric in appearance. Perhaps they were worried he would come back from the dead to murder again. For some reason, police decided to search his old room at the Pear Tree Tavern again in January 1812. A pair of stained trousers were found along with a bloody knife and the pocket watch stolen from the pub owner during the second batch of vicious murders. It seemed to very neatly confirm that Williams had indeed been the killer and the case was closed. About a hundred years later, his body was dug up and his skull kept as a grim artefact behind the bar at the Cran and Dolphin pub on the corner, although it has long since disappeared. Here's what I think happened, based on the available evidence, although this is a bit circumstantial. All three suspects, Williams, Hart and Ablas, met at the King's Arms pub. Hart may have told his friends about the layout of Mars' shop, as he had been working there as a carpenter that day. He may also have suggested that Ma had a lot of money stashed away somewhere. It's possible that Ma had angered the others somehow, by leaving the East India Company to set up his own business. Did they feel their old shipmate had got too big for his boots? Was it jealousy that he was running a successful business? It could even have been that one of them had approached Ma to ask for work, wanting to break away from the life of a sailor, but had been turned down. Whatever the reason, they made their way to Ma's draper's shop, fueled by alcohol. Perhaps Hart led the group and used his missing chisel as an excuse to come in and look for it. Ma could have turned his back to help him look, giving the thugs the perfect opportunity to hit him over the head. Once Ma was out of action, they locked the doors, extinguished the lamps, killed Mrs. Ma and the shop boy James Gowan, then made their way upstairs to search the bedrooms and murdered the baby to stop the crime giving them away. Before they could look for any money, they were disturbed by Margaret Jewell's door knocking. The fact that they went as far as to kill a three-month-old child supports the idea that this was a very personal crime and that for the trio, it was all about revenge. I believe it was all three of them, rather than just Williams, as this allowed them to commit the murders quickly. If there was only one assailant, surely the screams of Mrs. Ma and the shop boy would have been heard by the neighbours, who certainly heard the door knocking shortly after. Annoyed by the failed burglary, but growing bolder, Williams, Hart and Ablas now set their sights on another place they knew well. As they would be recognised at the King's Arms Tavern, they would have to ensure no witnesses were left behind. 14-year-old Kitty and the lodger John Turner were very lucky to escape the violence. After the Williamson's deaths, their pub was taken over by a Henry Burks, but it was closed and demolished around 1841. Today the road is almost unrecognisable and Mars Draper's shop has been replaced by apartment blocks. But the bloody memory of what happened those December nights lives on. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Prasher's Murder Map. If you enjoyed today's episode, the best way to let me know is to leave a 5 star review wherever you're listening. If you wish to leave feedback you can also reach me at prashersmurdermap at gmail.com. Next week we'll be setting up camp at Lake Bodum investigating Finland's most mysterious unsolved murder case. So until then, take care!